Hey there, honourable friends. Want to learn how women took the vote? Then watch this stupid video. We're going all the way back to 1918. Alex, roll the titles. Episode 2. Woman's Suffrage. Before we go any further, just who could vote before 1918? Wait, but stop. There have been some complaints about your accent. Complaints? No one can understand a word you're saying. Let's uh, try some of the other options. Now... The old law was set in 1867. Not a lot of people know that. No. This could work. No. Hi guys, please remember to like, share and subscribe and help us meet our new content bit rate share bad stretch goal. Oh, heavens no. Oh. No, let's just stick with what we've got. Just put the script in the subtitles. Fine. But there's nothing wrong with the way I talk. Just enunciate. So, who could vote prior to the 1918 general election? Well, the dash thing's a little bit complicated, so let's write it down, what? Before 1918, all women were denied the right to vote in Westminster elections. A men's right to vote was determined by a property test. Male property owners could vote, and so could men who paid £10 rent a year. The justification for this was that these men would be sufficiently invested in the welfare of the country to vote sensibly. You know, because poor people have no interest in ensuring the country is governed sensibly. Oh, you tell those dead Victorians. These laws meant that in England, two-thirds of men had a vote. In Scotland, three-fifths had the vote, and in Ireland, half of men could vote. It was on these grounds that Victorian and later Edwardian Britain considered itself a democracy. It's worth noting the situation was a little different for local government elections, where unmarried women who paid rates, i.e. property tax, were able to vote for their local representatives but not for their MPs. If it looks like these rules were an arbitrary mess, that's because they were. Boy, you're really giving those corpses hell. So how did politicians at the turn of the century attempt to justify denying suffrage to half the population? Why, it's simple. Sexism! <laughs> the sexist argument against giving women the vote was essentially that women were incapable of engaging in politics, or, even more insidiously, that their womanhood would be corrupted by entering the inherently male political arena. Opponents feared family harmony being shattered as husbands and wives differed politically and imagined laws being rewritten against male interests. And looking at the propaganda anti-suffragettes used, the fear of emasculation is clear. The belief in traditional gender roles and hierarchies, and what today we might call toxic, toxic masculinity, masculinity, was the sacred orthodoxy which the political class rallied to defend. God. Why did such well-dressed people be so terribly wrong? The opposition to giving women the vote wasn't solely limited to men. Some women were also against it, themselves being subscribed to notions of gender and femininity that precluded women from engaging in politics. One such example is Queen Victoria herself, who wrote in favour of Checking this mad wicked folly of women's rights with all its attendant horrors. Were women to unsex themselves by claiming equality with men, they would become the most hateful, heathen, and disgusting beings, and would surely purest without male protection. So basically, Queen Victoria would have shot up the YouTube recommendation bar. But of course, all that misogynistic claptrap was already centuries old by 1918. The more interesting question is how women were able to defeat it, and why suffrage came when it did. Women had fought their oppression for centuries before suffrage was won. Often individual women would succeed in defying norms to achieve degrees of personal autonomy, like Caroline Norton, an author who in 1836 divorced a sitting Prime Minister for adultery and gained ownership over her income from writing. Others managed to secure high levels of influence over British and international politics, like Sarah Churchill, the Jack Sparrow-looking character from The Favourite. But rarely was there change on a systemic level, and certainly nothing on the scale of the victory of 1918. So what changed? Well, for one thing, at various points in the 19th century, the right to vote had been expanded to new groups of men, such as Catholics in 1832 and men with property in 1867. This proved political activism could succeed in extending suffrage, motivating women to launch their own campaigns. One such woman was Lily Maxwell, who took advantage of a clerical error to cast a vote in the 1867 general election, with the greater plan of using the ambiguity in the word man to challenge the law. The courts eventually overturned her vote, but she garnered a lot of attention and demonstrated working class women were more than capable of holding political views. For another thing, throughout the Victorian era, the country was becoming more urban. 
just as city living makes it easier to buy a takeaway, catch a bus, or pay half your salary to live in what used to be a dining room, moving to towns and cities allowed like-minded women to meet and organise. The Industrial Revolution also changed the way women worked, with more women employed in factories, especially but not limited to large gender-segregated industries like textiles. Add to this a growing network of telegrams and railways crisscrossing the country, and the stage was set for an organised national campaign for reform. But let's not get too mechanicalistic about history, lest we be visited by the ghost of Kenneth Clark. These conditions only made it possible for women to secure the vote. It was the bravery and efforts of actual campaigners that achieved it. But hi, let's hop back to the montage verse. Okay, but hurry it up, we're running out of footage. There's two groups to know about here, suffragists and suffragettes. The suffragists came first. In 1897, many small, local campaign groups merged to form the National Union of Women Suffrage Societies, or NUWSS, for not very short. Their leader was Millicent Fawcett, seen here as a statue in Parliament Square. But the real Fawcett wasn't a statue, she was a human being, and an early campaigner for women's rights. Her activism was broad. She co-founded Newnham College, the first Cambridge college to admit women, and headed a condemnatory inquiry in the conditions within Britain's Boer War concentration camps. Central to her politics was a belief in peaceful campaigns that would convince society and MPs of the need to give women the vote. The suffragist methods were letter and pamphlet writing, peaceful marches and meetings with politicians. These methods were effective in spreading the arguments in favour of giving women the vote, but they did not immediately yield results. Six years after the founding of Fawcett's organisation, a group of women frustrated by a lack of progress splintered off to seek the vote through deeds, not words. They were led by Manchester's very own Emmeline Pankhurst, who was determined to become a lawbreaker so that one day she might become a lawmaker. She founded the Women's Social and Political Union, who were determined to be much more militant than Millicent. Diminutively labelled the suffragettes by a derisive Daily Mail, the group embraced the label. These are the women the films are made about. It was the suffragettes who broke into Parliament, who chained themselves to the iron rungs of the Women's Gallery in the House of Commons, who became arsonists and slash paintings, and who faced police brutality, including sexual assault, in what became known as Black Friday in 1910. The suffragette campaign of direct action quickly saw many arrested and imprisoned. While in prison, they demanded they be recognised as political prisoners, and began hunger strikes, intended to show they were no mere criminals. This put the Edwardian authorities in a politically difficult position. They didn't want to be responsible for the deaths of these women, but nor could they accept that they were political prisoners. The eventual response was force feeding via nostril or stomach tubes, an act which seemed tantamount to torture. The policy shamed the Liberal politicians in power and shocked the public who thought enlightened Britain was above such measures. Against white people at least. The legal fudge that the government ultimately used against the hunger strikes was the so-called Cat and Mouse Act of 1913, which allowed suffragettes to be temporarily released when their health weakened. But this did not slow the suffragettes' escalation. 1913 saw the most tragic moment of the suffragettes' fight for equality, when Emily Wilding Davison sacrificed her life to the cause. At the 1913 Epsom Derby, Emily Davison threw herself under the hooves of the King's horse, making headlines around the world. Though it is not clear whether she intended to die, with some citing her purchase of a return train ticket to argue she was only trying to attach a suffragette scarf to the horse, the act nevertheless showed the bravery and commitment of the suffragette movement, with moderate Fawcett later saying of Davison that her courage called to courage everywhere. Had peace lasted in the 1910s, it's impossible to say how the suffragette movement would have developed, or how Britain's male politicians would have reacted. But peace didn't last. When the Great War broke out in 1914, both suffragists and suffragettes voluntarily suspended their campaigns. This was partly out of genuine respect for the war effort, but also partly tactical. The key sexist charge against women was that they were too irresponsible to vote. By suspending their campaigns for the duration of the war, the suffragette campaigners would prove their responsibility and therefore their fitness to govern. Even radical Emmeline Pankhurst would rededicate her efforts to urging men to fight and for women to contribute to the war effort. Politically, it was a brilliant move. The work of women on the home front, particularly in heavy munitions factories, showed up the misogynistic arguments against women's suffrage for the nonsense they were, and made the case for votes for women unanswerable for most politicians. 
This led directly to the passing of the 1918 Representation of the People Act. But the victory wasn't total. The government that passed the Act in 1918 was a coalition, and that coalition contained Conservative MPs who feared that making the electorate majority female would be fatal for their electoral prospects. Fatality. As a result, the government fell back on that favourite tool of electoral inequality, a property test. To vote, women would need to be the owner or occupier of a property with a rateable value of five pounds and be over the age of 30. This meant that after 1918, only two in five women in the United Kingdom could actually vote, whilst the same act gave the vote to all men over the age of 21 and to soldiers over the age of 19. The different voting ages for men and women appears to have been entirely arbitrary and again intended as a means of ensuring that women would not become the majority of voters. It would be another 10 years before truly equal votes was introduced. But let's not be too down on things. All that said, the suffrage movement remains the most successful and radical campaign in Britain's political history. They did a reverse Thanos and double the size of the electorate. So who should get the credit? Suffragists or suffragettes? Well, for our part, there's no denying that the suffragettes are the more inspirational figures. And I semi own the apron off. But the boring middle of the road answer is probably closest to the truth. Both groups needed and benefited from the existence of the other. The direct action of the suffragettes ratcheted up the pressure on parliamentarians and made sure suffrage was never an issue that MPs could ignore, while the gradualist, respectable suffragists did the work necessary to ensure that off their time parliamentarians would eventually vote for some expansion of votes. The militant and moderate ends of the movement were symbiotic, which is to say that the success of one contributed to the success of the other. Since then, Many movements have sought to emulate this kind of political symbiosis, to varying degrees of success. Some, like the environmental movement, seem to make it work. Consider how the direct action of Extinction Rebellion in 2019 dovetailed with moderate Green politicians in Westminster, local councils and the European Parliament. Or how the radical BTS army on Twitter coordinated with the moderate G-Min stands on Tumblr to ensure the map of the Soul Persona album had a sufficiently fire drop in April of this year. Why are you trying so hard? Now unfortunately, despite women's suffrage, British politics will remain a bit of a sausage fest until 1979. That's not to say that there aren't a great many important and fascinating female politicians over the next 50 years, but we have to admit that the next couple of videos will be pretty dude heavy. I'm not sure what we can really do about that unless we build a time machine. There have been some issues with the time machine. Well. At least we have a Patreon stretch goal. Pledge one billion pounds and we'll go back in time and fix history. Pledge two billion and we'll give you a shout out at the end of it. But until that happens, 1918 will remain the first election where some women and men of all social classes were able to vote. And gosh, did this shake things up. If you'd like to see how, join us next week. We'll be looking at the origin of the new Labour Party, which is to say the old Labour Party. Compared to new Labour, which is now the old Labour Party, now that old Labour is the new Labour Party, but not the same new Labour that new Labour was to old... Alex, let's set the room back together. Okay. These costumes are not climate change ready. Now, perhaps surprisingly, it was actually a Conservative government that passed the Equal Franchise Act in 1928. Does that let the Tories off the hook for opposing equal votes in 1980? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And while you're typing, how do you think you would have reacted to Millicent Fawcett's decision to accept limited suffrage in 1918? Would you have been a suffragette, a suffragist, or a nasty old sexist? And did we here at Elections Generally foolishly start our series 30 years too soon because we were desperate to ensure some form of female representation? Let, let us, us know, know in the comments below.